Good morning, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. President of BYU, faculty, the um, hosts and academics who have invited me to be here, administration, old family who are not here but watching, I hope, and from Africa, and new family, the Smith family who are here in the audience, thank you so much for all your love and support. It feels very much like a homecoming for me being here at BYU. My father-in-law, Scott Smith, taught here for 30 years. I have numerous brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law, as well as three nieces who have been students, one of whom is still a student here today. But I should say that it's not just the, the fact that I am now affiliated very recently to the Smith family, but also over many decades growing up in Africa, the reputation of BYU is something that has stood out. As was mentioned in the introduction, I was born and raised in Zambia, Southern Africa, one of the poorest countries in the world. Zambia, then known as Northern Rhodesia, was a British colony. Today, the country has 17 million people and 50% of the population is under the age of 15 years old. Zambia is a copper exporter. Approximately 70% of the earnings that come through foreign exchange are through copper, mainly exported to China. I was born in Zambia and I was raised as a Presbyterian, and I'm sure you can tell I attended Catholic boarding school. Throughout my life, I did not realize until I was a college student that I did not have a birth certificate. Because at the time of my birth in 1969 in Zambia, birth certificates were not issued to black people. That law changed in 1973. You might be saying to yourself, well, what has that got to do with education? Which is the theme of the topic um, of this devotional and for this period of the semester. And the truth is, it has a lot to do with it. I know, I know, you're asking yourselves, how does a girl from a landlocked part of Africa, a small country, find herself not just speaking at BYU, but married to somebody who was born and raised, or actually just raised in Provo, um, right here around the corner? And the truth is, the answer is both complicated and simple at the same time because the answer is education. Without the education and without the opportunity to get an education, I would not be standing here today. But more generally, my hope this morning is to present you with a whole host of global trends, economic, geopolitical, and social trends that I believe will really dominate and define the global future. But perhaps most importantly, if we're not innovative about addressing the deep structural changes that are occurring around the world, there may not be many more people with the sorts of stories that I've just relayed to you. Stories of how in just 50 years, someone can be born in a country far, far away and not recognized as a human being, but in just 50 years, can have the opportunity to get an education and hopefully contribute to the global economy. My presentation today will start off by giving you a quick snapshot about where we are in terms of the global economy. I'll quickly follow on by giving you a bit of a, sne a sneak peek into how we are thinking about geopolitical issues around the world. I subsequently will highlight a handful of social challenges and social changes that are defining the world today. And then I would love to spend a bit of time talking to you about some of the deep structural changes that I believe will continue to challenge the global economy going forward. I must confess, in preparing my speech today, it's been a very difficult task. On the one hand, I've had a lot of people say to me, you know what, you're really addressing students. You should be positive and enthusiastic and energetic, which I'd like to think is my general um, demeanor. But on the other hand, 
People have said to me, my parents included, not just, just up to last, uh, just in the last few days, have said to me, this is BYU. And it's important for us to be honest about the real challenges the global economy is facing today. Not to make us feel sad and despondent, but really as an appeal to BYU's community, but the world in general, that we have to do something together in order to make sure that human progress can continue in a way that is constructive and brings everyone together. I've decided to err and listen to my parents once again, and so parts of what I tell you today might be hard to hear, and it certainly will not be Pollyannish. But I hope that when you leave today, you will not take away a glass half empty approach or thinking, but rather feel that you're more educated with respect to the global challenges that the world faces today. And in that respect, feel much more energized and armed to go out and try and help the world solve these deep structural and seemingly intractable problems. In another way of putting it, is hopefully forewarned is forearmed. So as promised, let me start off by talking to you a little bit about where we are with respect to economics. I start by saying that even before the global pandemic hit in earnest in 2020, we were already in a pretty precarious place. Economically, growth numbers over the previous 10 years have slowed quite considerably. And the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, in 2014 cautioned that on the back on the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008, we may never again see the rates of economic growth that we saw before 2008. McKinsey, the global consulting firm, made the point that the global growth rates for the next 50 years will be just half the global growth rates that we saw in the preceding 50 years. That's a report that came out by McKinsey in 2015. But in addition, and just to frame this economic growth challenge, which I believe is the defining challenge of our time, in order to double per capita incomes in one generation and meaningfully put a dent in poverty, an economy needs to be growing at 3% a year. As I stand here today, only a handful of countries are growing at that number. In fact, before COVID hit, the majority of developed and developing economies were growing far below that important number. Developed countries like the United Kingdom were growing at 1.4%. Germany posted a GDP number of 0% in Q4 of 2019. Meanwhile, across the emerging markets, the large emerging market economies, which are home to 50 million people, like Brazil, Argentina, Russia, South Africa, many places in Asia, were growing at around 1 to 2%. At stake are people's livelihoods and living standards, but also our ability to be active citizens in the democratic process. And more than that, if we're not able to increase the GDP pie and continue to pursue economic growth, our ability to create jobs, but also to enhance education and healthcare and to solve climate change becomes materially impacted. Now, if I haven't managed to depress you enough, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the, the political environment. Now, I'm not going to get into U.S. politics or us versus them. I think really what we need to take away are some of the big geopolitical themes that are creating a lot of consternation and concern. So, for instance, Martin Dempsey, who was the head of the Joint Chief of Staffs in the United States, basically has called this period the most dangerous period over his 50-year career. He's partly attributed this to the rise in terrorism around the world, 
but also the fact that the United States and Western society now has a rival economically and politically in the form of China, whose ideological, economic, and political beliefs are completely different to ours. Our ability to solve the big challenges that we're dealing with around the world means we've got to get across that proverbial divide and the aisle that separates people who have different views and ideological positions. But beyond the issues of ideology, which I'll come to again later, there were other political issues that were quite worrisome. Across many uh, uh, democratic societies, there's been a clear lack of interest with voter participation declining. Here in the United States, low-income households have just a 30% participation rate in the political process. And furthermore, Freedom House, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., has said there's been such a lack of focus on democracy that today 70% of the democracies in the world are illiberal and actually indistinguishable from authoritarian states. They have in mind countries like Venezuela, I imagine Russia, Zimbabwe, countries that are ostensibly democratic but really are moving away from what we believe to be a liberal democratic state. Let me move on very briefly to the question of social issues and trends that are governing the global economy. Of course, with respect to infrastructure, which is the backbone of economic success, the American Civil Engineers Survey, which comes out once every three years, has graded America's infrastructure, roads, railways, airports, bridges, etc., a D plus. Now, you might think to yourself, well, what do you care? This is just about America, but it's not. America's success or failure actually defines where the world goes next. And to the extent that you would have a D plus in your infrastructure basically does not bode well for America's economic future prospects, and therefore the prospects for the world. But putting infrastructure to one side, there are now studies, according to the International Rescue Committee, that we are part of or witnessing the fact that we have the highest number of refugees and displaced people ever recorded in history, around 70 million people. And furthermore, it's not just the CDC, but also in a wonderful book called The Drugs Don't Work, before COVID hit, there was a lot of evidence of, of an increased persistence and arrival of a lot of new communicable, communicable diseases and much more resistance to the remedies. So as an economist and as somebody who's very interested in business but also very interested in where public policy goes, we are really in a deep, challenging place. And I'd like to just spend the time that I have left talking to you about some of the specific challenges and the puzzles that economists like myself are spending an enormous time dealing with. I will list them out quickly and then I'll talk to you about them. And then of course, I want to remind you that we are not the generation where the world will end. We need to focus on solutions. And so through it all, I will offer you some perspective on how education will be able to help us think more broadly and innovatively to solve some of these challenges. So in no particular order, here are some key headwinds that will make things potentially worse if left unaddressed. One, technology and the risk of a jobless underclass. The fact that technology could displace workers and with more automation could increase what we're calling technical unemployment. Number two, demographic shifts. The quantity and the quality of the world's population is changing in a material way and in a way that has never been seen before. Number three, income inequality. I say income inequality, but the truth of the matter is we're talking about inequality in general. 
inequality in access to public goods like education and healthcare, but also inequality in the ability for people to materially alter their lives. Number four, natural resource scarcity and climate change. What this means in terms of our future. Number five, the sheer amount of debt that the global economy is carrying today and how that has moved from being a merely economic problem into now being a issue of geopolitics. And finally, number six, productivity. The economists in the room will know that productivity is the most important thing, most important contributor to why some countries grow and others do not. One of the biggest puzzles that we are dealing with right now as economists and public policymakers is why is productivity, the idea of how much each of us contributes to GDP, declining at precisely the time that technology has taken off? Once I've concluded these six items, I will spend a bit of time giving you some solutions and some hope for the future. As I mentioned, I do not believe that this is the generation where we will see the end of society and humanity. And we've seen challenges before. So I urge you through this all to think about this really as an opportunity and a roadmap for education and not really a, a, hope, a place for despair. So let's start with technology and the risk of a jobless underclass. At the turn of the last century in 1900, the United States workforce was 60% involved in agriculture, 60%. Today, that number is less than 3%. Less than 3% of Americans are involved in agriculture. And as historians and as economists, we know what happened. Through push and pull factors, Americans moved out of the agriculture sector into manufacturing and out of manufacturing into the service sector. Today, uh, roughly 80% of Americans are involved in the service sector and approximately 18% are involved in manufacturing. The question that we have is that how should we think about the fact that technology is providing robotics and automation that could actually displace human workers and therefore make un unemployment a much greater issue. In much the same way that we've seen the diminution of jobs over time, what will happen when we see robotics and automation take over the service sector as well as the manufacturing sector? We have some estimates already. According to the World Economic Forum, 85 million jobs will likely be lost because of automation uh, globally through to 2050. A seminal paper that was written by Oxford Martin School um, authors in 2013 argued that 47% of jobs in the United States would be lost by 2020. They have subsequently revised those numbers um, to be a little bit later, but fundamentally, the trend is clear that we will be dealing with the challenge of higher technological or technical unemployment as people lose their jobs. Now, the great British economist John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s had actually forecasted this. He actually suggested that by 2030, we would have a 15-hour work week. And he actually posed the question, what will we do with all that extra time? And he concluded, he hoped that we wouldn't end up in war, but actually that we might contemplate God. Whatever we will be doing, wherever we will be, the fact of the matter is from a public policy perspective, we have to think about what happens when multiple millions of people will likely lose their jobs because of the speed of technological change. The second issue I mentioned was demographic shifts. Today, there are approximately 8 billion people on the planet. According to the United Nations, the world's population will continue to grow at a clip until we hit 11 billion people in 2100. India is adding 1 million people a month, 
one million people a month to our population. And the global economy is adding 60 million people a year, which is roughly the size of Britain. As I mentioned to you, my home country of Zambia, a relatively small population of 17 million, has a lot of skew. And it's not uncommon in emerging markets to find that although the populations are relatively small, although they can be larger, the vast majority, or at least half of the population, is under the age of 15. We have got to provide jobs and opportunities for that group of people. And today, 90%, 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets. Now, you might think to yourself, well, that's an Africa problem, or it's a, Zam it's a Zambia problem, or it's a problem of the emerging markets. But it is not. It will be a problem in your backyard through disorderly migration, a very difficult thing to do, to have to move and leave your home and family and friends and context to move elsewhere because you're forced due to economic and political changes. But that might be the world that we're heading for if we cannot manage the demographics. I'd like to put the demographic shift in context. In 1960, a Time magazine cover heralded the fact that there were three billion people on the planet. From 1960 to where we are today, just around 60 years, we've managed to multiple, multiply increase the world's population. It took 125 years to go from 1 billion people to 2 billion people. It has taken us 60 years to go from a mere 3 billion people to 8 billion people today. We expect the world's population to keep growing at a clip. In places like my home country, it's growing rapidly. And we have to do something about managing the population growth, but at the same time thinking very clearly about what opportunities we can deliver for young people as they so sort of come online. It's not just the quantity of the world's population that's challenging, it's the quality of the world's workforce. According to the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, a study that they put out not too long ago, this generation of Americans, for the first time in the history of this country since 1776, will be less educated than the preceding generation. A survey of mathematics, science, and reading that comes out every three to five years by the OECD called the PISA study, the Program for International Student Assessment, has concluded that the United States, which used to be the number one, number two, number three in these subjects, mathematics and science, et cetera, is now in the bottom ranks, number 27 and 28 and 29. This is simply not good enough. It's not good enough for the United States and it's not good enough for the rest of the world. As you can see, even in this live experiment that we've just witnessed with the development of the vaccine, the world is heavily depending on the United States to get it right. So we've got to actually make sure we invest in education. We also have to think about the deep concern that was highlighted most clearly in a McKinsey report a number of years ago that the underinvestment in education of blacks and Latinos in the United States is so damaging that it could put the United States in a permanent economic recession by 2050. At a time when there's a massive pushback against immigration, you have to think very strategically about how an economy like the United States can possibly think that it can function and compete longer term when we're underinvesting in its own citizens. I'll now move on to the area of income inequality. When I was doing my PhD at Oxford, nobody talked about income inequality. We assumed that if we created economic growth, this would help us all be uplifted in terms of economic success, and in fact, we would be able to move from one economic class to another economic class, the so-called American dream. 
But have a look at the data today. The probability of being born in a low economic class and ending your life in a high economic class, what we term social mobility, has gone down by 50% in the United States over the last several decades. Social mobility is the backbone of solving the income inequality problem. And it's very inextricably linked, inextricably linked to the education problem that I highlighted a moment ago, that people cannot get out of their rut and hope to succeed in the issue of inequality if, they're not, if they don't have the opportunities to progress. But the income inequality challenge and the inequality challenge goes beyond American borders. According to Oxfam, one of the largest um, charities globally, the eight wealthiest men, and they're all men, have more wealth than the bottom 50% in the world today. So eight versus about 3.5 billion people. What are we going to do about it? Well, the truth is we need new ideas because as economists, we have tried the extremes. We have adopted tax and redistribution policies. If you look around places like Europe, and unfortunately, that has not helped to stem the tide. We've also looked at more what I'd call right-leaning, supply-side approaches, approaches where we thought about keeping the tax rate low in the hope of encouraging investment and job creation. But that has also not helped solve the problem of inequality. To make matters worse, the number one and number two largest economies in the world today, the United States and China, have two completely different political approaches and two completely different economic approaches, but they both have the same Gini coefficient, roughly the same Gini coefficient, which is a measure of income inequality. The United States, as you know, democratic society, believer, excuse me, believer in liberal democracy, um, and also very much about market capitalism is still the number one economy, but China, China is very aggressively the number two economy and has deprioritized democracy and has adopted a more state capitalist approach to its economics. These two economies, completely different in their ideological pursuits, have the same or roughly the same Gini coefficient at around 0.43. As was mentioned in the introduction, I've been very fortunate to be able to travel to many countries, over 70 countries developed and developing, rich and poor. And the fact of the matter is one of the most popular questions that I get, especially in developing countries, poor economies, what model should we pursue in order to make sure we don't have such a wide gulf in inequality? Should we pursue the Western model the United States adheres to, or the Chinese model? And this is one of the big challenges we have to deal with uh, continually. The next area I wanted to touch on was on the area of climate change, and particularly natural resource scarcity. In terms of natural resource scarcity, I've been very privileged to be part of a small group of 20, basically um, a number of economists and former policymakers and Nobel laureates um, who have an audience with the Chinese president every couple of years. President Xi Jinping, a few years ago, was asked in this private room, uh, in this gathering, what kept him up at night? What was the worst thing that he worried about and the most important thing that he was concerned about? And in that meeting, President Xi Jinping said it was natural resource scarcity. That somehow over time we have convinced the world's population that they can all live at the living standards of the average American. And yet, we were facing a decline in natural resources, arable land, potable water, energy and minerals. So that demand because of growing populations and urbanization, and just the sheer improvement in living standards in the emerging market would not be matched by the natural resource scarcity um, challenges that I just mentioned. 
But quickly moving on to that fundamental challenge, because some of you will probably be thinking to yourself, we've heard this before. 1700s, Malthus had mentioned that there would be natural resource scarcity because of population growth. We had that same concern in the 1970s when the Club of Rome also said we should be worried about natural resource scarcity. And of course, more recently, peak oil theories are people's concern about the, the diminution and the decline of natural resources and how we'll be able to feed and support our world's population. But the truth of the matter is we've looked at those problems and we've been bailed out by technology. So there's a great hope that technology could do that again. But at the same time, we are confronting the issue of climate change. Now, the truth is about climate change, I think I would say I'd be hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't at least say, you know what, I think we might have questions about the timing, we might have questions about the extent, but fundamentally, we largely, by and large, agree that there's something going on with humans creating or contributing to the heating of the earth. I come from a region of the world where there are millions of people who do not have access to energy in a cost-effective and reliable way. In fact, according to estimates, 1.5 billion people around the world do not have energy in a way that they can sustain themselves, certainly not in a world of Zoom calls that we've become so reliant on. I had the privilege of taking some of my new Smith family to Zambia with me, and um, also to South Africa, which is a middle-income country, and they saw firsthand the challenges of brownouts or the reduction or the shutting down of energy. In order to combat climate change, we can't leave those people behind. This goes back to the opportunity for education and to transform people's lives over a period of time in a way that's meaningful and to pursue human progress. We simply will not be able to do that without bringing everybody to the table to help address climate change. I can assure you, as somebody who serves on the board of a large energy company, we're doing everything in our capacity. We're investing in renewables like solar and wind and biothermal and geothermal, and biomass, as well as um, areas of nuclear generation four and a whole host of other new efforts to make sure that we can satiate the global demand for energy. But this is not a problem that's going away anytime soon, and we need new ideas and new innovation. I'll move on to the last two items very quickly. One is debt, and the other is productivity. Now, debt is an interesting one, because before we had COVID, again, in 2020, every class of debt in the United States, government debt, household debt, corporate debt, credit card debt, auto loan debt, and student loans were all each $1 trillion separately for each class. This is unsustainable, especially in an era of slow, low, and no economic growth. Today, 14% of American companies are what are called zombie companies, companies who whose cash flows are not enough to cover just the interest payment on the debt that they owe. But as I mentioned to you in my preamble, the problem of debt has moved from just being an economic one into now a geopolitical one. China is the largest foreign lender to the American government. And these issues around debt which have been exacerbated in the back of COVID, mean we have to come to the table with people and countries that perhaps we would not think about engaging with in years past. China today is not only the largest trading partner, foreign direct investor, as well as engaged partner from a political perspective for many developed and developing countries, but with respect to debt, China is now the largest debtor, largest lender to emerging market countries, bigger than the World Bank, bigger than the IMF, and bigger than the Paris Club. 
If we want to move on and figure out a future post-debt, which today is over 300% debt-to-GDP ratios, we have got to come to the table and engage. I should also just point out really quickly that with respect to debt, the problem with it, if you cannot pay it off, is that you're forced into corners where you might have to default. And I can assure you that that is not a place that we want to find ourselves. Productivity, I'll touch on as I run out of time here, very quickly, it's 60% of why one country grows and another one does not. The other two key aspects of, product, uh, of economic growth are capital and labor, which we've talked about, demographics and, and capital in terms of debt. But productivity is declining. The ability for each of us to contribute to GDP is declining at precisely the time that we think it should be increasing. This is a puzzle that's been going on for a decade, primarily in developed economies. There are a lot of theories about why that might be the case. I've written about this extensively myself. But the fact of the matter is we have to solve this problem in order to jumpstart and increase economic growth and therefore solve the whole host of problems that I've just outlined for you today. I'm coming to the end of my time here, but I'd like to leave you with some constructive ways to think about um, moving forward and staying positive. Now, the truth is we're probably not going to be the great, ever going to be the greatest generation. I think we can safely say that there was a greatest generation, but we can try very hard to be the second greatest generation. And that's going to require us to be very much more open-minded, less ideological, for government to be much more efficient in much of the same way that government in this country actually helps to build the interstate road network Government helped to build Silicon Valley, the Manhattan Project, and a whole slew of other initiatives where government worked in partnership with the private sector. We're simply not going to be able to solve these problems without efficient and effective government. But we also need to become much more aware of the trends that are going to define and really drive the world going forward. China is not going away. We have to engage. We cannot leave them out there to become a big rival. We have to engage. Technology, lots of scope for technology to move away from just being about social networks and you know, basically um, consumerism, but really being a tool for solving public good problems like education and healthcare. And then of course, there's an era, we're in the era of a green revolution. Our ability to think in a very smart and innovative way of how to, on one hand, solve the very urgent challenge of natural resource scarcity and climate change, but at the same time bring along the billions of people who are out there suffering under the weight of the decisions that we make every day. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm out of time, but I'm delighted for the opportunity to share with you a menu of opportunities for us to engage and get energized about how we can contribute to the world. And most importantly, how we're going to have to become less ideological and much more engaged in the societies in which we live. Thank you very much for your attention and opportunity to be here. Thank you.